Exhausted from just finishing surgery, I rushed to the door of the bar's private room. Before I could even step in, I heard Willow's voice. I don't want to get married, she said. He looked so cool when he took that knife from me back then. But now, seeing that scar on his forehead makes me sick, the next second, I pushed the door open. Then let's break up, I said. Willow leaned indifferently on her junior's shoulder. Seeing me leave, she sneered. He'll be begging me to get back together within three days. Girls, give me some ideas on how to make George give up for good. But half a month later, she was the one calling me from different numbers. George, she said, are you done? This is so annoying. To her surprise, the response was a woman's voice, he's in the shower. Do you need something? Willow shouted angrily. Anna, I thought you were my best friend, and you're stealing my men. Chapter 1 I pushed the door open with a loud thud, locking eyes with a startled Willow. Did you mean what you just said? Everyone in the room turned to look at me, dumbfounded. I knew everyone there, four of Willow's socialite girlfriends and two rich boys known for their wild partying. The guy next to Willow was her former junior, Makoto. When he saw me, he visibly flinched. I knew him. His mother was seriously ill and receiving treatment at our hospital. His family was already struggling financially, with his father borrowing money everywhere. Yet here he was, carefree, hanging out with a bunch of rich kids. Willow glanced at me as I entered, letting out a cold snort. She inched closer to Makoto, completely nonchalant. George, didn't you always say you're too busy to spend time with me? Well, now I've found someone to keep me company. With that, she wrapped her arm around Makoto's and leaned her head on his shoulder. The scene in front of me stung but I tried my best to keep my emotions in check. We're about to get married. What is this supposed to mean? A week ago, Makoto had given her a Hermes bag worth 50,000. I strongly objected to her accepting it, promising I'd buy her a new one after I got my paycheck next month. But she dismissed me, saying, if you won't buy it, and someone else will, who are you to tell me what to do? It's a gift, why shouldn't I keep it? Now, Willow looked at me with contempt. Marriage, sure. She placed Makoto's hand on her thigh. Since you heard everything, Let's be clear, you need to get a scar removal surgery first. The scar might be shallow, but it's a real eyesore. Don't you think so when you look in the mirror? My heart ached sharply. Five years ago, I saved Willow from a thug and took a knife for her. The blade cut across my forehead, nearly blinding me. I dreamed of growing old with her, but now she was disgusted by the scar I got for her. It wasn't really about the scar, though. Like Willow said, she was tired of me, and everything about me annoyed her now. The scar she once called a badge of honor had become an ugly mark. What if I refuse? I asked, my voice surprisingly calm. Willow scoffed. George, there are so many guys chasing after me. Do you think you're the only one willing to take a knife from me? You expect me to be grateful for a lifetime over that one incident. You think you can use that scar to guilt trip me forever? Suddenly, she seemed like a stranger. After I saved her, she insisted on being with me. She would wait for me outside my dorm every day, shyly handing me homemade lunchboxes. She would bombard me with messages, sometimes even ranting if I took too long to reply, just to be with me. Eventually, I gave in and started dating this loud, insistent girl. I tolerated all of Willow's whims, but I never expected that one day she would grow tired of me. Is that so? I said quietly. Then let's break up. Chapter 2. My words were like thunder out of nowhere, freezing the smile on Willow's face. She stared at me, almost in disbelief. Whenever we fought, she was always the one to bring up breaking up, but I had never said it. This was the first time, break up, she repeated raising an eyebrow like it was the funniest joke she'd ever heard. Have you gotten cocky after all this time together? George, do you really think you're in a position to say, break up, to me? Mary, who was sitting on Willow's left, tried to smooth things over. All right, all right, she said, getting up. Dr. Wong, it's my birthday today, and I invited some boys to have fun. Willow hasn't paid attention to anyone all night. You're always so understanding. Don't stoop to her level. Understanding. I had lost count of the times I swallowed my pride to make peace indulging her, but that was when we were still in love. From now on, I was done. Pack your things. I'm moving out, I said, then turned and left. Willow's voice followed me into the hallway, loud and mixed with anger she couldn't hide. George, you've really grown a backbone. Huh? If you walk out that door, don't you ever come back. I ignored her, walking out without hesitation. In the corridor, I could vaguely hear Willow's words. Wanna bet? He'll come crawling back tomorrow like a puppy. Don't I know him? She added, as if it wasn't enough. What will it take for George to give up on me for good? Maybe I just won't show up on our wedding day. I shook my head, smiling bitterly, and blocked all of Willow's contacts. Chapter 3 I left the bar and sat in my car, unable to calm down for a long time. Memories of Willow chattering beside me replayed like an old movie. In those moments, she used to say, You think I'm annoying? Well, I'm going to annoy you for life. You can only be with me. Marry me. When you pushed me away and took that knife. Wow. I thought you were the coolest guy in the world. 
George, how many kids should we have? If we have kids, will you ignore me then? Maybe she had long since grown tired of me, and tonight I just happened to hear it. I went home, packed all my clothes, and the next day contacted an agent to look for an apartment. I eventually chose a loft-style place with space upstairs for my medical books. The apartment was close to the hospital where I worked, a 10-minute drive. Two days passed without a word from Willow. Of course, I wasn't going to contact her either. Five years of dating ended just like that. As a surgeon, I was busy every day, so I had no time to dwell on a failed relationship. That night, after my last gastrectomy, it was already past nine. I took off my surgical gown and saw David's message from ten minutes ago, inviting me out for a drink. I rubbed my sore neck and headed to the bar he mentioned. It was a quiet bar with soft background music playing, not noisy at all. Huh. You broke up with Willow. When did that happen? Weren't you two about to get married? Didn't she adore you? David fired off questions like a machine gun, making my head spin. I took a sip of my drink. We broke up a few days ago. Yeah. She adored me. Now she's tired of me. David sighed. Wow. People change fast. When you were in residency, she used to wait at your dorm every day like a little wife. It seemed like she was dead set on marrying you. I smiled bitterly. I couldn't reconcile the image of Willow clinging to me back then with the Willow from the bar that night. My second kid is almost here. And you're still single, David said, raising his glass. Need me to introduce you to someone? No. Thanks. Not planning on jumping into anything new. Maybe when my family starts nagging me to get married, I said, downing my drink. David quickly snatched my glass. Whoa. Whoa. You're a lightweight. Are you trying to drown your sorrows and stick me with the tab? But the glass was already empty. David drove me home, and I was sober enough to walk straight and find the right building. But once in the elevator, my vision started blurring. I fumbled for my keys my whole body feeling light as if it were on fire. The clink of the key against the lock echoed loudly in the quiet hallway, but the door wouldn't open. Willow, I'm back. Open the door, I mumbled, banging on the door. After a moment, the door opened. The faint scent of orange blossoms wafted out. A woman stood there, her long hair wet, wrapped in a white towel, looking stunned. I blinked hard, trying to see her face. Willow, why didn't you dry your hair again? With that, I stumbled inside, and the woman stiffly moved aside. Chapter 4 my steps were unsteady as I looked around. Where's the hairdryer? I asked. You're drunk, came a woman's voice. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have drunk, I slurred, searching for the hairdryer but unable to find it. This was supposed to be my home, but why did everything look so unfamiliar? Where did you put the hairdryer? I turned back to the slender figure and sighed helplessly. Dry your hair before sleeping, or you'll get a headache. Why do you always make me worry? George, do you even see who I am? I paused, blinking hard to see the person in front of me but her features overlapped, blurry and indistinct. The last thing I remembered was the thud of my body hitting the ground. When I opened my eyes the next morning, a pounding headache from the hangover greeted me. I was going to be late for work. That thought exploded in my head, and I jumped up, only to see the room clearly and be stunned. This wasn't the apartment I had rented. White fabric sofas, a row of cute plushies in front of the TV, and several potted succulents on the balcony. Where was I? Chapter 5. You're awake. A soft female voice spoke. I looked up and saw a familiar face standing in the living room. Anna. One of Willow's close friends. Anna had been there that night in the bar when I broke up with Willow. Sitting quietly in the corner without saying a word, I rubbed my eyes hard, thinking I was still dreaming. David had dropped me off at my building last night. So why was I now in Anna's place? You must have walked into the wrong apartment after you got drunk, Anna said, stepping closer. Her expression calm as she looked at me on the sofa. You live in 602, right? I saw you the morning before yesterday. I was speechless. Anna lived in 601. What a coincidence. Aren't you supposed to be at work today? Anna asked. I checked the date on my phone and sighed in relief, shaking my head mechanically. Anna suddenly laughed for some reason, a small dimple appearing at the corner of her mouth. Don't worry. You behaved just fine, didn't do anything you shouldn't have. With that, some fragmented memories from last night came rushing back. I seem to have said, Willow, open the door. I'll dry your hair for you. Why do you always make me worry? Thinking about it sent a shiver down my spine. Drinking causes trouble. After breaking up with Willow, I hadn't planned on having anything more to do with her or her friends. And now I had inexplicably spent the night at one of her best friend's places. What a mess. Feeling frustrated, I ruffled my hair. And as I stood up, my temples throbbed painfully. I'm sorry for last night, I said. Regardless, it wasn't right for me, as a man, to drunkenly barge into a woman's home. It's okay, Anna shrugged. I was just about to head out. All right. I said, as I was about to leave, I noticed a pendant hanging from the jewelry box on the nearby table. It looked familiar, a delicate teardrop-shaped jade pendant, with gold wire wrapped around the top to secure it to the chain. Half a month ago, 
Willow had watched a short video and said she envied girls who received handmade gifts from boys when they were in school. I went to a friend's jade carving shop to learn how to carve jade, though I wasn't very skilled. I carefully selected the jade, polished it into a teardrop shape, and wrapped the top with fine gold wire to ensure it was securely attached to the chain. The jade pendant necklace at Anna's place was identical to the one I had given Willow, even down to the tiny flaw on the edge. This, I said in confusion, looking up to meet Anna's eyes. There was a flicker of unease in her eyes, and she quickly looked away, hurrying to the door. I'm late for work. Lock the door and leave the key under the mat, she said, almost running out. Chapter 6. I stood there, dazed. I hadn't interacted much with Willow's group of friends, and I had hardly spoken to Anna. She had just returned from abroad last year, graduating from a prestigious university. Willow had mentioned that Anna pursued fashion design despite her family's objections and was now an associate editor at a fashion magazine. Anna had also attended Willow's birthday party this year. Unlike the outgoing and lively girls in the group, Anna was always quiet and seemed hard to approach. If the necklace was the one I had given Willow, why was it at Anna's place? And stranger still, why did she seem so nervous? When I gave Willow the pendant, she had turned her nose up at it. Could it be that she didn't like it and gave it away? Forget it. It didn't matter anymore. I left Anna's apartment and returned to my own. Just after washing up, I received a call from an unknown number. Hello, I said. I thought it might be a delivery, but there was no sound from the other end. Hello, I repeated. After a long pause, Willow's voice came through, her usual bossy tone intact. George, it's been days, and you still haven't come to apologize. Is your temper getting worse? I closed my eyes, taking a deep breath. We're broken up. Please don't call me again. Willow laughed. Break up. Did I agree to that? Makoto is just a good male friend. I only had him keep me company to make you jealous. You didn't really take it seriously, did you? George. Why are you so petty? I said nothing. Ending the call. Moments later, Willow called again, and I immediately blocked the number. That night, during my shift, I hadn't expected Willow to come find me in person. She tossed a late night snack onto my desk, her voice full of arrogance. I don't know what's gotten into you lately, but I'm giving you a way out. Take it while you can. If I really get mad, we're done for good. I paused, holding my pen, then slowly looked up at her. Willow met my gaze, her expression nonchalant. That necklace I gave you, why haven't I ever seen you wear it? I asked. Do you even love me? That ugly necklace, how could I wear it out in public? Willow seemed to think my question implied I wanted to reconcile, and she started acting coy again. She pointed at the scar on my forehead and said, I wasn't joking the other day. That scar on your forehead is ugly, really jarring. Get it removed, and then we can get married. I laughed coldly to myself. Get out. I snapped. Stop bothering me. Okay, you don't want to get married and I have no intention of marrying you. George, you're really pushing it. Willow shouted, kicking the leg of my chair in anger. Break up. Fine, but if you're a real man, don't come crawling back. She slammed the door and stormed off. Chapter 7. My life gradually settled into a routine. For the next month, I was busy going back and forth between home and the hospital, preparing a paper for a medical journal. Patient number 32, Anna. Please proceed to consultation room 4. When the patient walked in, I wondered if it was just someone with the same name, but it was really Anna. Since that night when I had accidentally spent the night at her place, we had occasionally run into each other in the elevator, but only exchanged nods. What seems to be the problem? I asked as usual. Anna stared at me for a few seconds before answering. I was previously diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux, but recently, my loss of appetite has gotten worse. I feel uncomfortable after eating. I nodded thoughtfully. Are your meals regular? What about your bowel movements? Any frequent constipation or diarrhea, Anna looked embarrassed. Mostly just one or two meals a day. My bowel movements are okay. I gave her an inquiring look. If you're worried about doing an endoscopy, you can start with an abdominal ultrasound and a fecal occult blood test. If you haven't eaten breakfast, you can get in line for the tests now. She nodded. All right. Anna stood up and took the prescription slip from my hand. When she reached the door, she suddenly said, Dr. Wong, this is the second time I've seen you in a white coat, before I could react. She had already closed the door. As the next patient entered, I didn't dwell too much on Anna's words. That evening, when I got home, Anna's door across the hall opened just as I was about to enter my apartment. Did the test results come back? I asked. Everything okay? Yeah. It's the usual problem. Anna replied. I nodded and was about to go inside when she suddenly called out. Wait. I have something for you. A few seconds later, Anna came out holding that necklace. When I left your place that day, she was packing up and told me to throw this away. Anna said gripping the pendant tightly, but I didn't. I kept it. If it bothers you, I'll give it back now. Before I could say anything, she quickly added, if it doesn't bother you, I'll keep it. I was speechless. 
If I couldn't understand what Anna meant by now, I'd be playing dumb. Anna, you. But I didn't get a chance to finish. She spoke first. George, I like you. She seemed to have gathered all her courage to say it and continued in one breath. I made an appointment with you last year, before I knew you were Willow's boyfriend, and I liked you then. But the next day, I saw a photo of you two on her social media, and I realized I was too late. As a doctor, I saw many patients every day, so I didn't really remember treating Anna. She said, I know it's selfish, but the night you broke up, I was cheering inside. Maybe fate wanted to give me a chance, because I didn't expect my new neighbor to be you. Anna smiled slightly, her lips curving into a small smile. Dr. Wong, now that you're single, can you give me a chance? I froze, not expecting her to be so direct. Take a week to think about it. Okay. Anna tilted her head, her eyes full of hope, afraid I'd reject her. She turned and went inside, closing the door. I let out a bitter laugh. Even if I were to start a new relationship, it shouldn't be with one of Willow's friends. Chapter 8 The next day, I was on my usual rounds. During lunch break, I saw a familiar figure in the hospital lobby. It was Willow. The men next to her turned around just then. Through the crowd, my eyes met Willow's. She looked startled for a moment, then immediately grabbed Makoto's arm, looking at me provocatively. I just glanced at her before stepping into the elevator, but something unexpected still happened. That evening, after reviewing some special cases, I left the hospital and felt two people following me. The thought barely crossed my mind when they quickened their pace and caught up with me. A glint of light flashed in the darkness, a knife. I was about to run when something struck the back of my knee. I stumbled, and the two men quickly closed in. One of them yelled, Damn it, you're the heartless doctor. My mother could have lived for years. He cursed, and his knife swung toward me. I dodged just in time. He raised the knife again, and I kicked him in the knee, pinning him to the ground. But the other guy raised a brick, ready to smash it onto my head. At that moment, a slender figure rushed over. She grabbed the man's wrist, but he shoved her away, causing her head to hit the railing behind her. Chapter 9 Anna I shouted. The commotion quickly drew attention, and the two men tried to run but were caught by several security guards rushing over. I picked Anna up and ran to the emergency department. Blood covered the back of her head. She groaned softly her face contorted in pain. It hurts. Anna winced. My heart pounded as I placed her on a gurney and reported her condition to the on-duty emergency doctor. Anna was immediately taken for scans and bandaging. The results came back quickly, a moderate concussion. I looked at her pale face, my voice stern. That was so dangerous. Why did you rush over? You should always prioritize your own safety. Understand. Anna pouted. Her voice aggrieved. Did you think about that when you saved Willow back then? I was speechless. Anna blinked and said. Just think of me as a good person who did a good deed. She then half-jokingly added, Dr. Wong, don't feel so burdened. I'm not asking you to marry me, you know. Seeing her wrapped in white bandages yet still joking, I sighed helplessly. I'm not that great. If you date me, you might be disappointed. You might. Anna interrupted. No, to me, you're the best. You have a kind heart. You're patient and gentle with your patience. You were considerate and tolerant to your ex-girlfriend. And you take relationships seriously with principles. I've seen you feed the stray cats at the hospital, and I've seen how caring you were with Willow. I've always envied her for meeting you before I did. I clenched my fingers tightly. I never imagined that the small things I did would be seen as virtues by someone and remembered so deeply. The necklace Willow despised was something Anna cherished. I once risked my life to save Willow, and now there was a girl who risked herself to help me when I was in danger. It would be a lie to say I wasn't moved. Anna, let's be together. I heard myself say it. One of my principles was to be straightforward in relationships. Anna had feelings for me, and I had no reason to leave her hanging. Her eyes seemed to sparkle. Really? You're my boyfriend now? Yeah. I told her not to move, but Anna insisted on leaning closer, playfully kissing my forehead and gently touching the scar there. A tingling sensation spread through my body, like tiny electric currents exploding through my veins. Not ugly at all. She whispered, then curled up under the blanket, hiding her blushing face. Chapter 10 I thought I'd let him cool off for a couple of days, but it's been over a month now, and he still won't talk to me. He's blocked several of my numbers. Willow complained, sprawled listlessly on the sofa. Something crossed her mind, and she scoffed. Does George really think I'll be the one to back down first? In his dreams, Mary lit a cigarette and said, if you give in this time, it'll happen again. He'll have the upper hand in the relationship from now on. She paused. By the way, where's Anna? Just then, the private room door opened. Anna walked in. Wearing a black dress with a teardrop-shaped jade pendant necklace hanging around her neck, Willow's expression froze. Her eyes locked onto the necklace. Anna, that necklace around your neck, isn't that the one I told you to throw away? Anna nodded calmly. Yeah, I liked it. Thought it'd be a waste to toss it. Willow pursed her lips, momentarily speechless. Mary scrutinized the necklace, realization dawning on her. Isn't that the ugly pendant George gave you? 
Willow stood up, walked straight over to Anna, and said flatly, Anna. She paused before continuing, Give me back the necklace. Though her tone was even, there was something forceful about it. Anna met her gaze and said, Didn't you say you didn't like it? Willow replied, I like it now. Is that not allowed? She held out her hand. Give it back. Anna lowered her eyes, then suddenly smiled. Willow, you've always been like this, bossy. From childhood to now, man man and I have gotten used to it. The limited edition dresses everyone liked always had to go to you. On trips, if you got tired, we all had to stay at the hotel because of you. It's as if the whole world has to revolve around you, and you accept it all as a matter of course. She took a deep breath. You didn't want this necklace, so I kept it, and now you don't like that. Willow snapped. It's different. This was a gift from George. She reached out to grab the necklace. Anna caught her wrist, reminding her. You two have broken up. Willow's face darkened. A ringtone broke the tension. Anna took out her phone, the screen displaying the word boyfriend. Her expression softened. Hello. Yeah. Just wait at the intersection. I'll be right out. Mary tilted her head curiously. Anna. You have a boyfriend. Why didn't you tell us? When did you start dating? Recently, Anna said. Looking Willow up and down. I'll introduce him to you all some other time. I can't stay and drink with you today. Gotta go. She turned and left. The room fell silent. Mary. Willow said. Turning slightly. I feel like the guy on Anna's phone just now sounded kind of familiar. Mary guessed. Could it be a mutual friend of ours? By the way. What's going on with you and Makoto? Does Dr. Wong think you're cheating on him? Is that why? Willow loudly denied it. There's nothing between us. I was just upset that George was always so busy. So I wanted to use Makoto to make him jealous. To get him to spend more time with me. You're right. George must have misunderstood and thought there was something between me and Makoto. And that's why he's still mad. She seemed to be talking to herself. As if she had finally found the reason for their problems. Nodding. She said. Yeah. He still cares about me. Willow smiled to herself. Her expression lightening. Chapter 11. At midnight. I had just come out of the shower when I heard Anna talking to someone on the phone in the bedroom. George. How long are you going to ignore me? Makoto is just a friend. I was just so angry and wanted to make you jealous. To get you to spend more time with me. You've been saying you're busy lately. Never having time for me. Always having excuses for not replying right away. Am I not supposed to be upset? It was Willow's voice. Anna held my phone. Saying nothing. Her eyes meeting mine. Willow continued. Hello, George, are you listening? This is the last time I'm giving you a way out. Don't push your luck. Tonight is your last chance, if you still want to marry me. Let's stop this cold war. Anna's lips parted, and she said, Willow, this is Anna. Silence fell on the other end. I stood still, making no move. Anna spoke softly. George is in the shower. If you need something, call back later. A few seconds of silence. Then Willow's angry voice came through. Anna, I thought you were my best friend and you're stealing my boyfriend. Anna replied calmly. I'm not stealing him. George and I got together after you two broke up. With that, she ended the call. I walked over to the bed, placing her cool hand under the blanket. Anna was trembling. I pulled her into my arms, gently stroking her back. In a muffled voice, she asked, aren't you mad at me? Understanding her unease, I said, why would I be mad at you? If I didn't want you to say those things, I would have stopped you just now. When I broke up with Willow that night, I never intended to get back together with her, so, with you, it's clean and simple, no burden, okay, Anna hugged me tightly, chapter 12, the next day, I didn't have any appointments, and Anna was heading out of town for a few days, I loaded her suitcase into the car, and she patted the dust off my sleeve, suddenly, a hysterical voice rang out, you shameless mistress, Willow's eyes were brimming with tears, and she cursed, pretending to be my best friend while secretly stealing my boyfriend, she stormed over, Raising her hand to slap Anna, I immediately held her back. Anna squinted slightly. Willow, you gave him up. How does that make me a third party? She said. Weren't you the one who said you were afraid George would keep clinging to you? Now he's out of your life, just like you wanted. What more do you want, if anything? It's you who has been clinging on since the breakup, isn't it? Willow's face was streaked with tears as she stared at Anna, as if her spirit had been drained by those few words. I sighed. Willow, it's over between us. I said, I don't regret saving you, I would have done the same for anyone, but that night, when you leaned against Makoto and called my scar ugly, I knew we were done, my heart died in that moment, Willow, I don't love you anymore, and I ask that you not interfere in my life again, Willow clung tightly to my wrist, shaking her head, no, it's not like that, I never wanted to be apart from you, I thought you were just mad at me, I shook off her hand, Willow collapsed to the ground, her eyes full of tears, George, are you really done with me? Yes, there's no future for us. I couldn't be bothered to say more. Getting into the driver's seat, in the rearview mirror, Willow's figure grew smaller and smaller until it disappeared. 
During Anna's business trip, we video chatted every day. It turned out we had a lot of common interests, even our favorite movie director was the same. The night before, we talked about Hitchcock until 2 in the morning. I'll have a little gift for you in your back, I said, feeling a little embarrassed as I touched my nose while watching Anna remove her makeup over the video call. All right, Anna replied, her eyes full of anticipation. Chapter 13 Willow didn't show up again after that day. One day, I finally got off work on time for once, and there was a car parked at the hospital entrance. One glance at the license plate, and I knew it was Willow's father's car. Martin rolled down the window. Dr. Wong, let's have a chat about you and Willow, he said. I got into the car. Martin didn't speak until we arrived at a hospital. Willow cut her wrists, Martin said abruptly. I admit, I never approved of your relationship and was harsh toward you. But Willow is my only daughter, and she's determined that you're the one for her. Sir, we've already broken up, I replied. Martin clenched his fists. If you'll get back together with her, I'll agree to any conditions you ask. Feelings aren't something you can bargain for, I said, turning to leave. George, Willow stood there, dressed in a hospital gown, her face pale her wrists wrapped in bandages. She rushed over, hugging me tightly, sobbing uncontrollably. I'm sorry, it was all my fault. I lost you. George, please forgive me. Okay. Chapter 14. Willow. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, I said, you don't love me as much as you think, it's more about not being able to accept it. No, that's not true. I love you so much. Willow clung to me desperately. You're so wonderful. Only a fool would give you up. I'm sorry. George, I've cut ties with Makoto. There's nothing between us anymore. Let's get back together. Please. I'd never seen Willow like this before. She had always been proud and willful. Never so humbled. I already have a girlfriend. I said. I watched as the light slowly faded from her eyes. She stared at me. Tears streaming down her face. Is there really no chance? Even if you break up with Anna someday. I still won't have a chance. No. I answered without hesitation. Willow's sobs grew louder. Her entire body trembling. You can't do this. You treated me so well before. You made me depend on you, and now you're just abandoning me. Willow, the cracks between us were made by your own hand. I said coldly, you knew my limits, yet you chose to flirt with other men. You once called the scar on my forehead a handsome badge of honor, but later said it was ugly and disgusting. From the moment you said those words, we became two parallel lines that would never cross again. I pried her fingers off my clothes and started to walk away. Willow grabbed at my pant leg, crying, George, I was wrong, I really was. Can you give me another chance? I'll change, I promise. No, I didn't linger, nor did I look back. Chapter 15. Three days later, Anna came back. I had just finished the new pendant I was working on. Anna eagerly put the necklace on, saying, How did you know I liked cats? Wow, it's so cute, chubby like a big orange tabby. I gently touched the cat-shaped jade pendant on her neck, feeling the warmth of the stone and the softness of her skin, because I saw you have a lot of clothes with cats on them. I paused. As for that teardrop one, you can throw it away, if you want. I'll practice more and make you some nicer ones. Anna raised an eyebrow, teasing me. I'm not throwing it away, it's your first masterpiece. Her words made me laugh. The winter days grew colder, and soon it was New Year's. Anna and I had planned to visit a neighboring city for two days, but one of my colleague's wives went into labor early, and I had to cover his shifts. Our travel plans were canceled. Anna understood, but I knew she must have been a little disappointed. That day after work, she saw the bandage on my forehead and stammered in worry. Why you're hurt. I quickly shook my head. No, no. I just had scar removal surgery on my forehead. A doctor friend of mine did it, and he said it'll heal well. Anna froze. She stared at me, her concern turning into unease. Why did you do that? Tears welled up in her eyes, and she asked softly, was it because of Willow? She said if you removed the scar, she'd marry you. Anna. I cut her off. Willow and I have nothing to do with each other anymore. I had the surgery because I don't want you to be reminded every time you see it that I once saved another woman. Anna's mouth opened slightly. Then she suddenly broke into a smile through her tears. Chapter 16. Two years later, Anna and I officially registered our marriage, and soon after, we held our wedding. On the wedding day, besides family and friends, some close colleagues attended. I hadn't expected Willow to come. After two years, she was even thinner, lacking vitality, with a faint smell of bitter medicine lingering around her. Congratulations, she said, smiling at me before downing her glass of wine. I nodded, not saying much. Right after the ceremony ended, hotel staff reported that they had called the police. A body had been found in the second floor women's restroom. I looked at the familiar clothing and face, and my pupils constricted. It was Willow. She had taken her own life. Later, I received a letter from Martin. It contained only a few sentences. I'm sorry, I know. As a doctor, you despise those who treat life lightly. But if I can't be your bride, 
How else could I make sure you'd remember me for the rest of your life? George, in the next life, let me be the one to spend my life with you. Okay, 